Hi everyone and welcome back to the History in 20 podcast, thanks for listening again. Uh, we're on to part three of the Plantagenets mini-series and today we'll be covering the 5th and 6th Plantagenet kings respectively, who are Edward I and Edward II. So if you're not sure what I do on this podcast, I essentially aim to cover anything history related within 20 minutes or so, hence the name. And I've got all the links to all my different social media accounts and email addresses you can contact me on if you'd like any requests. So I've got quite a lot to cover on this one because the two are my personal favourite Plantagenet kings, so I did quite a lot about them. So let's get on with it. So where do we start? Well, Edward I was uh, born in, thir- in 1239, not 1339, he was born on either the 17th or 18th of June 1239 in Westminster Palace in London. And he succeeded Henry III, he was the direct descendant of him, He was Henry III was his father. And he was coronated on the 19th of August, 1274. So he was known as Longshanks. You might have heard of him from that in the Robin Hood film, Prince of Thieves, I think it is. He's pretty much referred to Longshanks constantly. And that's because of his six foot two height, which obviously was a giant for the day. It's a giant to me now, but there we are. Uh, And he was in Sicily in 1272 when he learned of his father's death. But he didn't actually rush back to England straight away. Instead, he first paid homage to King Philip III of France, who was the son and heir of Louis IX, who was king last time we did a podcast. I mean, it hasn't been that long, but yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, he allegedly said to him, I do you homage for all the lands which I ought to hold of you. So right from the offset, we think, right, here we go, crusading king, great. So... What was Edward's first task? Well, his first initial task was to reunite his realm because it was obviously divided from the bitter baronial wars under Henry III. But instead of punishing the barons for going against the crown, defying the crown, Edward actually forgave them and he allowed them to buy their properties back, which had been confiscated by Henry III. So it was a good diplomatic move from Edward. It made him seem sort of magnanimous and unifying, while it also at the same time cleverly and importantly raised funds for the English crown. But Edward had also learned from the rebel barons in his father's reign that power lay in the towns and the villages rather than the city centres where everyone's going to agree with him because they're within striking distance from him. So he set out to find information on all this corruption, which again was a good PR move essentially uh, because it reinforced the relationship between the king and the people versus these fat cats quotation marks. So this particular corruption was actually recorded in a document known as the Hundred Rolls. But unfortunately the Hundred Rolls were too detailed to actually gather any real problems. So an example from them is one of Hugo Bunting who was the bailiff of Stamford who levied an illicit toll of five shillings on William Gabbercrocky when he took some of his millstones through the middle of the town. So imagine this level of detail, multi- detail multiplied by the entire country. So as a result, very few prosecutions actually took place. But like I said earlier, the PR counted. Edward was showing that he could guarantee rights for all of his subjects and that he actually cared about the people. So it was a great start to his reign and also an effective answer to the barons who claimed that a strong royal government meant an oppressive royal government. So he sorted the barons out. What's his next issue? It was from over the border, Wales. So I'll apologise to any Welsh listeners for these pronunciations because I'm really not sure on how we pronounce them. So if someone wants to let me know, please do let me know in the comments below. So by the 1270s, Wales had actually experienced their first taste of nationhood. They took advantage of Henry III's baronial wars and Llewellyn the Great and his grandson Llewellyn ap Griffith had extended control over the majority of Wales from their base in Snowdonia. By 1276, Edward didn't want to accept Wales as an independent power. Instead, he insisted on homage or ritual submission, which the rulers of Wales traditionally paid to the English kings. Uh, Llewellyn, uh, Llewellyn Ap Griffith, this is, he was summoned three times and he refused all three times. So as a result, Edward declared war on Wales on the 12th of November 1276. Now, Wales were obviously a smaller nation than England and the funds that Edward had raised through these baronial uh, sales and stuff, I mean, Llewellyn's army was no match for Edward's and Wales were forced to accept English laws and it were, they accepted them on the 9th of November 1277. So it had taken Edward just short of a year to force the Welsh king into submission. And upon the victory, Edward then imposed a peace treaty on Wales, but the Welsh found it humiliating, much like, if you remember two episodes ago, when 
uh, Richard I imposed the treaty upon the king of Bohemia and he found it humiliating, similar sort of thing. And it failed to give Llewellyn's brother, Daffid, the rewards he expected. So come 1282, the Welsh rebelled again. Now Wales faced another huge English army, but Edward cleverly, rather than the hand-to-hand combat of the 1276-77 campaign, he opted to lay siege to Snowdonia and starve them out. And Wales was absolutely crushed under this military occupation. And Edward also declared now that waging war against the king was treason, which was a new crime that he'd invented, which needed a new punishment. Now Daffid was unfortunate enough to be in the receiving end of this. He was hung, drawn and quartered. So it was another resounding victory for Edward against Wales. Now, like his father, Edward liked to build, and he built his castles in Wales. And you have examples of Caerphilly Castle, Caernarfon Castle. They're all castles built in Edward's reign to sort of show the Welsh how powerful England were. And then we fast forward to the mid-1280s now, and we go the other direction. So in Edward's empire was at its absolute peak. It stretched from east to west across the British Isles. But the French king, Philip III, was threatening his lands in Gascony while Scotland was almost about to fall into his hands. So in 1286, King Alexander III of Scotland was killed when he fell off his horse. Uh, and his only granddaughter, Margaret, who's known as the Maid of Norway, was seen as his heir. Now Edward proposed that she should marry his son and heir, Prince Edward. The Scottish magnates agreed to this proposal at the Treaty of Burgham in July 1290, but insisted that Scotland should re- retain its own laws and customs. Now, unfortunately for Scotland, Margaret died aged six in Orkney on 12th September 1290. And Edward, realising how close Scotland was to becoming English territory, seized this opportunity to assert his overlordship for the throne of Scotland. He proposed John Balliol to be King of Scotland. He was known as the Pretender in Scotland. But in saying that, Balliol's claim was through the fact that he was David I's great, great, great grandson through his mother and therefore one generation closer than his main rival, Robert Bruce, who was grandfather of the famous Robert the Bruce, who we'll see a bit later. Now, on St Andrew's Day, 1292, Balliol was enthroned and proclaimed King of Scotland at Scone. Now, this hadn't gone as smoothly as it seems, though, because in order to fund the conquest and the parliaments in Scotland, Edward had to tax the population heavily, and as a result, he expelled the Jews in 1290. Approximately 3,000 of them left, and they didn't return till they were invited back by Cromwell over 300 years later. Now, medieval England was a very anti-Semitic place, and especially in the late 13th century. And one chronicle actually reported that the Knights of the Shire were so pleased about the expulsion of the Jews that they offered one fifteenth of their goods to Edward I as tax, while the church also donated generously. It yielded £116,000, which is the single biggest tax collected in Britain during the entire Middle Ages. Uh, The Edwardian historian, he's a famous historian, great historian, Mr Mark Morris, he actually states that the expulsion of the Jews was the most popular act Edward ever committed, which shows exactly how anti-Semitic England actually was. Now, up until Balliol's crowning, Edward was actually justified in his claim that his actions had helped to maintain peace in Scotland. But from 1292 onwards, his control and treatment of the Scots ultimately provoked a long and disastrous war. And in 1295, Edward summoned the model parliament because due to the rules of Magna Carta, people could not be taxed without the consent. So Edward needed the funds in order to wage war against Philip IV in France and Scotland. So in order to vote whether to continue funding for his conflict, he needed this parliament. But fierce resistance to the English did not help the Scottish cause and war had also broken out in France. But, like in 1292, Scotland was so close to Edward's gain. So he didn't give up the Scottish cause, and it contributes to his namesake as well, Hammer of the Scots. So Scotland was provoked into rebellion, and Berwick was the first town to fall. Now, Berwick was one of these towns that throughout Edward I, II, and III's reign, it was constantly going back between English and Scottish uh, protection. So it was an interesting one that it was the first to fall. But Edward reclaimed it, temporarily anyway, and he then took Dunbar. And he famously besieged Edinburgh Castle overnight in winter 1296 after five days. And Stirling fell before he had even arrived. So Edward I used to boast that Scotland had fallen in 21 weeks. But most significantly in the siege of Edinburgh Castle, Edward I had removed the Stone of Scone which was the sacred stone on which Scottish kings had been crowned upon for 400 years, 
and he took it to Westminster Abbey and it was actually kept there for the next 700 years. It was actually returned by John Major in 1996 when he was trying to improve relations with the Scottish, so clearly some things never change. But after defeating the Scots in 1296, Edward then turned his attention to France. He left for Gascony on the 24th of August 1297 and left Earl John de Warren to subdue Scottish revolts. Uh, on the 11th of September 1297, de Warren's forces met the Scottish leader William Wallace and his forces on the banks of the River Forth near Stirling Bridge. Now, after lengthy negotiations, Hugh Cressingham, who was England's treasurer of Scotland, lost patience and crossed the bridge to meet Wallace. Wallace's troops slaughtered the vanguard while the English could do nothing but look on helplessly. Now, Cressingham was killed and his skin was apparently made into a belt for Wallace, which was a bit of a legend that was told among Scottish chroniclers. Now, Edward returned to England in March 1298 and in May of 1298, he moved his government to York to help administer the war effort a bit further north. So in June, he mustered an army of 28,000 men at Roxburgh, just over the Scottish border, and battle commenced on 22nd of July, 1298. And similarly to his Welsh campaigns of the 1270s and 80s, the English army completely outnumbered their opponents, and it was a resounding victory day won. And there was a bit of a gap here in uh, interesting stuff, because the years from 1298 to 1303 saw actually very little action north of the border. And any of the minor campaigns achieved very little. The, uh, for example, the Lanacost Chronicler commented on the campaign of 1300, saying that the king did nothing remarkable in this time against the Scots whose land he entered, because they always fled before him, skulking in those moors and woods, wherefore his army was taken back to England. But then we'll fast forward a bit to 1305, and William Wallace we come into, and he was betrayed by Edward I, and Edward decided to make an example of him because he'd humiliated him years ago. So he put him on trial and he executed him in London in the same manner that Dafford had suffered 23 years earlier. Now, over in Scotland, in 1306, Robert the Bruce crowned himself King of Scots. He was the first king to crown himself that for 400 years without the Stone of Scone. And as with Wales in the 1280s, Edward saw Scottish resistance not as war, but rather as rebellion against his legitimate rule. So, 1307, Edward was on his way north to Scotland to wage war against Bruce when he fell ill. And on the 17th of July, 1307, he died. And his body was sent back to Westminster Abbey and the words Malleus Scotorum, Hammer of the Scots, were inscribed on his tomb. And his death was kept secret for almost a fortnight. So what legacy does Edward leave behind? Well, the chronicler Walter of Gisborne wrote that anybody who spoke about it was imprisoned. Most chroniclers wrote about how England was in despair after Edward's death, and when the news reached Pope Clement V, he reportedly could not stand because of grief. And other chroniclers also shared the views about Edward's death. Peter Langtoft, who was an English chronicler, wrote that he was so noble and great, so potent in arms, that a man could talk of him for as long as the world endures. And judging by the fact that I'm on 13 minutes in this podcast, it seems that way too. So, in contrast... The Scottish chronicler John of Fordoon wrote that Edward I stirred up war as soon as he'd become a knight. He troubled the whole world by his wickedness and roused it by his cruelty. Obviously, he's a Scottish chronicler writing from a Scottish perspective about a guy who is called Hammer of the Scots, so that interpretation isn't really very surprising. But overall, his legacy as a king is second to none. He's definitely one of the greatest Plantagenet kings, and he's also one of the greatest kings in the medieval world. But again, his reputation is helped slightly by the fact that his reign was so successful because he fell in between two sort of less successful kings under Henry III and Edward II. But nevertheless, he does deserve all praise in his own right. He managed to subdue the Welsh and the Scots and for brief periods between 1296 to 97 and 1304 to 06, he ruled over the entirety of the British Isles. And no monarch had actually managed to do this before him, and it will not be achieved again until the 17th century. But the story of Edward I's successor, Edward II, is very different. Now, Edward II, I did my dissertation on him, so he's one of my favourite kings, and I don't like to see him roasted too hard, but I'm going to have to go in a bit with a bit uh, more vigour than I did in my dissertation, I think. But anyway, let's find out about him. So he was the 14th child of the 16 children that Edward I, Eleanor of Castile, had, and he was the fourth eldest son. So all three of his older brothers, John, Henry and Alfonso, had all died before they were 12 years old and before Edward I died, so Edward II became heir. Uh, 
Now, he was born in Kernerfan Castle in Wales on the 25th of April, 1284. Uh, and he was actually the first heir to the English throne to bear the title Prince of Wales because he was born in Wales. But it's also a tradition that's upheld. I mean, Prince Charles is actually, his official title is Prince of Wales. So it's still a recurrent theme that we can thank the Plantagenets for, for that one. So, in April 1290, he was betrothed to the Maid of Norway, but she died before they'd even met, so they were both only six, seven years old. And in 1299, in order to facilitate an Anglo-French peace, Edward was betrothed to Philip IV's daughter Isabella, but they did not marry until after Edward came to the throne. He remained married to her throughout his reign. Now, the most famous thing that people think about Edward II for is that he was an alleged homosexual. And there were accusations of this because he did have a, a very friendly relationship with a French nobleman who he was raised with called Piers Gaveston. Now, these accusations plagued Edward's reign and his reputation as king. And apparently when he was still prince, he'd asked his father to bestow some lands upon Gaveston. And Edward I replied, you want to give lands away, you who never won any, and threw him out of the room. Then Gaveston was exiled for six months. So fast forward to 1307 and Edward II was crowned upon Edward I's death. So he was present at Loudon Hill in Scotland where Edward I died. And according to the famous 14th century chronicler Jean Frossart, upon his death Edward I asked Edward II to carry his bones on campaign with him in Scotland. But instead Edward II sent his body back to Westminster and that is what cursed his reign according to Frossart. So after the failure at Loudon Hill in 1307, Edward stayed out of Scotland for three years and he returned again in the winter of 1310-11 to and it was another military disaster. England lost 10 castles. They had 40 castles in Scotland and they lost 10 of them. And the historian David Simpkin argues that it was either an example of his determination to succeed in Scotland like his father or an attempt to avoid meeting his adversaries in London and face the repercussions of another failed campaign. Now, the anonymous chronicler and author of the Vita Eduardi Segundi actually contended that Edward returned to London in the immediate aftermath of the campaign, that had he returned, that death, imprisonment or worse would perhaps befall him. But the result of this failed campaign led to the establishment of a group of the Ordinances, a group of ordainers who Edward was to consult before any further military campaigns. And this again relates back similarly to John and Henry III and the struggles they both faced after the implementation of Magna Carta in 1216. So, in 1312, Piers Gaveston was captured and allegedly tried for treason against the Crown and then executed. And Edward was furious and accused the Ordains of murder, but nothing came of it because they were obviously against him. He had to talk to them about injustices and obviously they're not going to admit that. But they'd removed the threat, what they saw as the threat of Gaveston to the English throne. And Edward then again stayed out of Scotland for another two years after 1312, but this time it was a huge diplomatic error. Because we saw earlier Robert the Bruce had crowned himself King of Scotland and it gave Bruce more and more power and the upper hand in this period that is known as the Scottish Wars of Independence. So Bruce reclaimed Roxburgh Castle and Edinburgh Castle in early 1314 and he essentially invited Edward to battle in Scotland with him because Edward had to go. So the 23rd to 24th of June 1314, it's a date that I know very well because half my dissertation was on it. And it's the infamous Battle of Bannockburn, and it's one of the most catastrophic defeats in English military history. So the losses were absolutely enormous on the English side. Uh, so we'll start off on the night of the 23rd of June from uh, a knight in the English, uh, an English knight, sorry, in the English camp, Alexander de Setham, slipped away into the Scottish camp and he told Bruce's forces that morale was low. So if ever you intend to undertake to reconquer Scotland, the time is now. The English have lost heart and are discouraged is what Thomas Gray, the chronicler, writes about it in the Scala Chronica. But de Setton's escape from the English camp was not reason for the defeat at Bannockburn. So the Earl of Gloucester and the Earl of Hereford were both arguing over who should lead the vanguard, and Gloucester actually argued with Edward III, Edward II, sorry, which led Edward to accuse Gloucester of cowardice. Now, Gloucester was provoked by the King's comments. He advanced to meet the Scottish forces, and he was killed instantly. Now, the Scots pushed the English back into the Bannockburn, the little stream river that ran through it, and hemmed them in against the riverbanks. There was hundreds of English forces hemmed in against them, crushing each other. And the, the Scots had pushed the English so far back that the English lost formation and they broke rank. And the battle was a disaster. So the contemporary chronicler John of Troclo wrote that 
Edward actually fought like a lion and had to be dragged away from the battlefield. But regardless of personal bias from the chroniclers, it was clear that this defeat humiliated Edward as a military leader, especially given the success of his father, and as we'll see next time, his predecessor, his successor on the battlefield. So in the aftermath of Bannockburn, the Vita Edwardi Segundi argues that Bruce's army numbered 40,000 men in comparison to England's 20,000, and this has since been disproved, unfortunately, for Edward. It's highly unlikely that Bruce's army actually numbered over 6,000 men compared to England's 20,000, which is again why it's such a, such a humiliation. And Harold Hutchinson, who's one of the few 20th century historians sympathetic towards Edward II, argues that huge numbers of English soldiers undoubtedly led to overconfidence among the ranks, which is clear to see. So, following the defeat in Scotland upon his return to England, circumstances went from bad to worse for England. There was the famous famine of 1315 to 17, which wasn't helped by torrential rains in the summer and autumn and a harsh winter from 1314 to 15, which killed livestock and didn't help the crops grow. So the bad weather continued almost relentlessly until 1321. But, I mean, this famine, famine also affected Scotland too, and both English and Scottish forces on the border raided their opposing country to try and steal crops. And it was during this period that Bruce raided as far south as Yorkshire. And Edward's next conflict was in Yorkshire, the Battle of Byland Abbey on the 14th of October 1322. And surprise, surprise, it was another defeat for Edward II. Now, the Scots had surpassed the English with their warfare techniques and had abandoned war horses for more foot soldiers, resulting in a quick and resounding victory for the Scots, but it was putting more pressure on Edward as king. So, in an attempt to bring peace between England and Scotland, Andrew, Andrew Harclay, who was the Earl of Carlisle, signed a secret peace treaty with Robert Bruce in January 1323. And the, the treaty aimed to recognise Bruce as rightful king of Scotland in return for protection of the northern English counties from Scottish raids. Now Edward II found out about this and he was enraged, so he had Harclay executed, but rather hypocritically and ironically, Edward then signed the truce of Bishop Thorpe in May 1323, which, guess what? It recognised Bruce as the rightful King of Scotland and it aimed to keep peace for 15 years. Didn't keep peace for 15 years, but kept it for about five years. Better than nothing, I suppose, though. But, as ever with the Plantagenets, it wasn't just Scotland that troubled Edward II. We go back over the English Channel to France. Now, the War of St. Sardos broke out in 1324, and Edward's brother-in-law, Charles, it was his wife's brother, Isabella's brother, he'd become King of France in 1322, so he was Charles IV, and he was significantly more aggressive than his predecessors. And in 1323, he demanded that Edward should come to Paris and pay homage to him. Edward refused, and a group of Edward's soldiers hung a French official in 1323, October 1323, which led to relations souring between the two kings, which led to a confrontation in Gascony. So Edward's army in Gascony was 4,400 strong, while Charles's, commanded by Charles of Valois, was 7,000 strong. So Edward's got a weaker army, so understandable that he might lose. Uh, but Valois took the Agenais, cut off Bordeaux, and he successfully ended the war less than six weeks after it had begun. Another failure for Edward II on the battlefield, but although given the numbers of the armies, like I said, it is understandable that England didn't win. Now, the fact that Edward had invaded his wife's lands infuriated her, and for the most part, they were a distant couple anyway, uh, obviously the, which enhanced the rumours of Edward's alleged homosexuality, but he still expected her to return to England. But instead, she stayed in France with her brother and Edward's son and heir, Prince Edward. And by 1326, when Edward had still not returned to England, it was clear that she was having an affair with Roger Mortimer, who was one of the exiled marcher lords from the Civil War of the well, Civil War inverted commas of 1321. Now, both Isabella and Mortimer wanted rid of Edward II and another noble family who'd been on the royalist side of the 1321 conflict, the Dispensers. You might know them as Hugh Dispenser the Elder and Hugh Dispenser the Younger. Now, Edward's opponents gathered around Isabella and Mortimer in France, and Edward feared they'd invade England. So, throughout August and September 1326. Edward mobilised defences along the south and east coasts of England to protect against a possible invasion. And he also issued a rather nationalistic appeal for people to defend England, but as both he and the dispensers were widely disliked, it came to little avail. So the 24th September 1326, Roger Mortimer, Isabella, Prince Edward and Edward II's half-brother Edmund of Woodstock arrived on the Suffolk coastline and were met with very little resistance. 
So from his base at the Tower of London, Edward attempted to gather support from the Londoners, but instead his government turned against him. So he fled from England and into Wales. Now upon reaching Cardiff, Edward went into hiding in Carefully Castle while his authority completely collapsed in England under Isabella and Mortimer's rule. And he then fled to Barclay Castle in Gloucestershire where it was deemed more secure. But on the night of the 21st of September 1327, Edward II died. Now it was said that he was killed with the aid of a red-hot poker inserted into him, which again enhances rumours of his homosexuality, but that's open to interpretation. Might have happened, might not. We don't actually have any proof. But... uh, Again, like I said, it's claimed likely related to the rumours of his homosexuality, but nevertheless, on the 23rd of September, Edward III was informed of his father's death and the tumultuous start to his reign begun. Now, what legacy did Edward II leave behind? Well, it's a difficult one to decipher because for some contemporaries, he was a useless king, he was a homosexual, and he was a weak military leader, and this rhetoric was also echoed by historians right up until the late 20th century. But as societal changes have come around in the 21st century, a lot of historians like Catherine Warner, uh, Harold Hutchinson I mentioned earlier, they don't regard Edward's possible homosexuality as a weak factor in his kingship. And like I said with Edward I, it's worth noting that Edward II's reign came between two kings who were renowned for their military successes, Edward I and Edward III. And they're not just, it's not just that, they're two of the finest warrior kings in medieval Europe and they were always going to overshadow Edward II's reign. But if you want to let me know your opinion on Edward II, feel free in the comments section or drop me an email or comment on Facebook or anything. And I'll see you next time for the fourth and final episode in the Plantagenets mini-series. So thanks for listening and I'll see you next time. Thanks.